안녕하세요. 꾸준한 영어 테드쌤입니다. 오늘도 버니클라 낭독을 하기 전에 시 낭송에 이어서 테드 읽기 또 도전해 보도록 하겠습니다. 테드 읽기가 지겨워지면 또시 낭송에 들어갈 수도 있고 다른 걸 찾아낼 수도 있습니다. 항상 낭독이 계속 같은 부분만 하다 보니까 그 부분을 어, 재미를 좀더 업시키기 위해서 제 자신의 재미를 말씀드리는 거예요. 어, 다라, 다른 다양한 방법을 시도하고 있으니까 많이 어, 양해해 주시고 또 같이 연습하실 수 있는 분들은 연습하시면 좋겠습니다. 자, TED Talk 3분 39초 분량의 Why the pencil is perfect 입니다. 한번 읽어보도록 하겠습니다. 저는 3분 35초에 맞췄어요. 배경음악 빼고 읽어보는 거니까 3분 35초에 들어가보도록 하겠습니다. Why the pencil is perfect? The sound is a really big part, I think, of the experience of using a pencil, and it has this really audible scratchiness. A small thing, big idea. The pencil is a very simple object. It's made of a weight with some layers of paint, an eraser, and a core, and a core, which is made out of a graphite, clay, and water. Yeah, it took hundreds of people over centuries to come to this design. And it's that long history of collaboration that, to me, makes it, a, makes it a very perfect object. The story of the pencil starts with a great find. People started finding really useful applications for this new sub substance. They cut it into small sticks and wrapped it in strings, string or sheepskin or paper, and sold it on sold it on the street of Rwanda to be used for the writing of writing or for drawing or a lot of times by farmers and the shepherders shepherds who used it to make their animals over in france nicolas jackie conte figured out a method of grinding the graphite mixing it with the powders of clay and the water to make a paste From there, this paste was filled into a mold and filed in a clean in a kiln, kiln, and the result was a really strong graphite core that was breakable, that was smooth and usable. It was so much better than anything else that existed at the time, uh, existed at the time, and to this day, that's the method that's still used in making pencils. Meanwhile, over in America, in Concord, Massachusetts, it was Henry David Thoreau uh, who came up with the grind, uh, grading scale for different hardness of pencil. It was graded 1 through 4, number 2 being this idea hardness for general use. The softer the pencil, the more graphite it had in it, and the darker and smoother the line will be. The firmer the pencil, The more clay it had in it, and the lighter and the fine, finer it will be. Originally, when pencils were handmade, they were made at round. There was no easy way to make them, and it was the Americans who really mechanized the craft. A lot of people credit Joseph Dixon for being one of the first people to start developing actual machines to do things like cut wood slats, cut grooves into the wood. Uh, apply glue to them, and they figured out it was easier and less wasteful to do a hexagonal pencil, and so that became the standard. Since the earlier days of pencils, people had loved that they can be erased. Originally, it was bread crumbs that were used to scratch, scratch away pencil marks, and later rubber and uh, pomice. pomice. The, the attached eraser happened in 18, 1858 when American stational Heimer Ripperman patent, patented the first pencil with an attached eraser, which really changed the pencil game. The world's first yellow pencil was the Koinur 1500. Oh, yeah, 벌써 시간 다 지났네. 2분 16초 분량에. 3분 30초가 지났다는 얘기는 1분 30초 되게 늦다 그죠? 어 그래도 끝까지 한번 읽어보고 나서 다시 도전할게요. Coiner did this crazy thing where they painted this pencil with it. 
14 coats of yellow paint and the dip day, the end in 14 karat gold. There is a pencil for everyone, and every pencil has a story. The Black Wing 602 is famous for being used by a lot of writers, especially John Steinbeck and Vladimir Nabokov. And then you have the Dixon Pencil Company. They are responsible for the Dixon Ticonderoga. It's an icon. It's what people think of when they think of pencil and what they think of when they think of a school. And the pencil is really a thing that I think the average user has never thought twice about how it's made or why it's made the way it is. Because it's just always been that way. In my opinion, there's nothing can be done to make the pencil better than it is. It's perfect. Wow. 생각보다 까다롭다, 그죠? 오케이. 다시 도전합니다. Why the pencil is perfect? The sound is a really big part, I think, though, of the experience of using a pencil, and it has this really audible scratchiness. Scratching, small thing, big idea. Carol, Caroline River on the pencil. The pencil is a very simple object. It's made of a wet with some layers of paint on it. Uh, an eraser and a core which is made out of a graphite, clay and water. Yeah, it took hundreds of people over centuries to come to this design. And it's that long history of a collaboration that, to me, makes it a very perfect object. The story of the pencil starts with a graphite. People started finding really yeah. useful applications for this new substance. They cut it into small sticks and wrapped it in string or a sheep skin or paper and sold it on the street of London to be used for writing or for drawings or a lot of times by farmers and shepherds who used it to mark their animals. Over in France, Nicolas Jack Conte figured out a figured out a method of grinding the graphite, mixing it with powdered clay and water to make a paste. From there. This paste was filled into a mold and fired, fired in the kill. And the result was a really strong graphite core that wasn't breakable, that was smooth and usable. It was just so much better than anything else that existed at the time. And to this day, that's the method that's still used in making pencils. Meanwhile, over, the, over in America, in Concord, Massachusetts, it was Henry David Thoreau who came up with the grinding scale for different hardness of pencil. It was graded 1 through 4, number 2 being the ideal hardness for general use. The softer the pencil, the more graphite it had in it. And the darker and smooth the line will be, the firmer the pencil, the more clay it had in it, in it and the lighter and the finer it will be. Originally, when pencils were handmade, they were made around, there was no easy way to make them, and it was the Americans who really mechanized the craft. A lot of people credit Joseph Dixon for being one of the first people to start developing actual machines to do things like cut wood slats, cut grooves into the wood, apply glue to them, glue to them. And they figured out it was easier and less wasteful to do a hexagonal pencil, and so that became the standard. Since the early days of pencils, people have loved that they can be erased. Originally, it was bread crumbs that were used to scratch away pencil marks and later rubber and pumice. The, the attached erasure happened in 1858 when American station owner Hyman Ripperman patented, patented, patented the first pencil with an attached erasure which really changed the pencil game. The world's first yellow pencil was the Koh-i-Noor, 1500 koh did this great thing where they painted this pencil with 14 coats of, of yellow paint and dipped the, the end in 14 karat gold. There is a pencil for everyone, and every pencil has a story. The Black Wing 6, 602 is famous for being used by a lot of writers, especially John Steinbeck and Vladimir Nobkov. And then you have the Dixon Pencil Count Company. They are responsible for the Dixon Ticonderoga. It's an icon. It's what people think of when they think of a pencil and what they think of when they think of school. And the pencil is really a thing that I think the average user has never thought twice about. How it's made or why it's made the way it is. Because it's just always been that way. In my opinion, 
there's nothing that can be done to make the pencil better than it is. It's perfect. Wow. So, I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. 어, 수, 수세기에 걸쳐서 수백 명의 사람들이 바꾸고 바꾸고 바꿔서 어, 완성한 어, 결정판이라고 얘기하는 거죠. 음, 굉장히 재밌습니다. 한번더 읽어보겠습니다. 3분 35초 맞춰보겠습니다. 자, 후. Why the pencil is perfect? The sound is a really big part, I think, of the experience of using a pencil, and it has this really audible scratchiness. Scratching, small thing, big idea. Carol, Caroline Weaver on the pencil. The pencil is a very simple object. It's made of a wet with some layers of paint and eraser and a core, which is made out of a graphite, clay, and water. Yeah, it took hundreds of people over centuries to come to this design. And it's that long history of collaboration that to me makes it a very perfect object. Perfect object. The story of the pencil starts with graphite. People started finding really useful applications for this new substance. They cut it into small sticks and wrapped it in string or sheepskin or paper and sold it on the streets of London to be used for writing or for drawing, or a lot of times by farmers and shepherds who used it to mark their animals. Over in France, Nicolas Jacques Comte figured out a method of grinding the graphite, mixing it with powdered clay and water to make a paste. From there, this paste was filled into a mold and filed in a kill, and the result was a really strong graphite core that wasn't breakable, that was smooth and usable. It was so much better than anything else that existed at the time. And to this day, that's the method that's still used in making pencils. Meanwhile, over in America, in Concord, Massachusetts, it was a Halley David Toto Tru who came up with the grading, grading scale for different hardness of pencil. It was graded 1 through 4, number 2 being the ideal hardness for general use. The softer the pencil, the more graphite it had in it, and the darker and the smoother the line will be. The firm the pencil, the more clay it had in it, and the lighter and the finer it will be. Originally, when pencils were handmade, they were made of round. There was no easy way to make them. And it was the Americans who really mechanized, uh, mechanized the craft. A lot of people credit Joseph Dixon for being one of the first people to start developing actual machines to do things like cut wood slats, cut grooves into the wood, apply glue to them. And they figured out it was easier and less wasteful to do a hexagonal pencil. And so that, be so that became the standard. Since the early days of pencils, people had, have loved that they can be erased. Originally, it has red crumbs that were used to scratch away pencil marks and later rubber and permits. The attached eraser happened in 1858 when American stationer Hyman Rippman patented the first pencil with an attached eraser, which really changed the pencil game. The world's first yellow pencil was the Coin Coinure 1500 Coinure did the Christine where the well they painted the pencil with 14 coats of yellow paint and dipped the M in 14 karat gold. There is a pencil for everyone and every pencil has a story. The Blackwing 602 is famous for being used by a lot of writers, especially John Steinbeck and the Baltimore Vladimir Nabokov. And then you have the Dixon Pencil Company they are responsible for the Dixon Tikon Tikon de, de Ruga. It's an icon. It's the and what people think of when they think of a, think of a pencil, and what they think of when they think of a school, and the pencils really a thing that I think the average user has never thought of twice about how it's made or why it's made made the way it is because it's just always been that way. In my opinion, there's nothing that can be done to make the pencil better than it is. It's perfect. Wow, uh, 거의 다 Hmm. 그러니까 이게 연음을 쓰고 음이 청크 단위가 음, 확실하게 이제 좀 길어지고 여기서는 이런 부분들을 잘 염두에 둬야 돼요. 그러면 제가 이제 말을 전달해야 되는 것들 뉘앙스를 알고 해야 되기 때문에 성급하지 않고 이렇게 전달하면서 얘기를 해야 되는데 아직까지 성급하죠. 음한번더 해보겠습니다. 도전에 성공을 해야 되겠죠? <웃음> Ha <laughs> ha.
<clears throat> Why the pencil is perfect? The sound is a really big part, I think, of the experience of using pencil. And it has this really audible scratchiness. Scratching is a small thing, big idea. Caroline River and the pencil. The pencil is a very simple object. It's made of a wet with some layers of paint on the eraser and a core, which is made out of a graphite, clay, and water. Yeah, it took hundreds of people over centuries to come to this design. And it's the long history of a collaboration that, to me, makes it a, it a very perfect object. The history of the pencil starts with the graphite, and people started finding really useful applications for this new substance. They cut it into small sticks and wrapped it in a string of sheepskin or paper and sold it on the street of London to be used for writing for, or for drawing, or a lot of times by farmers or shepherds, and they used it to mark their animals. Over in France, a Nicholas Jack content figured out a method of grinding a the graphite, mixing it with the power, power of the clay and the water to make a paste. From there, this paste was filled into a mold and filed in a kiln, and the result was a really strong graphite core that was breakable. That was smoothly usable. It was so much better than anything else that existed at the time. And to this day, that's the method that's still used in making pencils. Meanwhile, over in America, in Concord, Massachusetts, it has a handy day the truth who came up with that grading grading scale for different hardness of pencil. It was graded 1 through 4, number 2 being the ideal hardness for general use. The softer the pencil, the more graphite it had in it, and the darker and smoother the line will be. The firmer the pencil, the more clay it had in it, and the lighter and the finer it will be. Originally, when pencils were handmade, they were made round. There was no easy way to make them, and it was the Americans who really mechanized the craft. A lot of people credit Joseph Dixon for being one of the first people to start developing actual machines to do things like cut wood slats, cut glues, grooves into the wood, applying glue to them. And they figured out it was easier and less wasteful to do a hexagonal pencil. And so that became the uh, so that became the standard. Since the early days of pencils, People have loved that they can be erased. Originally, it was breadcrumbs that were used to scratch away pencil marks and later, rubble and pomace. The, the attached eraser happened in 1858 when American stationer Hyman, Hyman Ripman patented the first, the first pencil with an attached eraser, which really changed the pencil game. The world's first yellow pencil was the Koinur 15,000 Koinur. The, the crazy thing where they painted this well, they painted the pencil with a porting coat of yellow paint and dipped it at the end in porting carat gold. There is a pencil for everyone, and every pencil has a story. The Black Wing 602 is famous for being used by a lot of writers, especially John Steinbeck and Baltimore Nob Nobkov. And then you have the Dixon Pencil Company. They are responsible for the Dixon Ticonderoga. It's an icon. It's what people think of the when they think of pencil and what they think of when they think of school. And the pencils are really think, really think that. I think the average user has never thought twice about how it made or how why it made it the way it is because it's just always been that way. In my opinion, there's nothing that can be done to make the pencil better than it is. It is. It's perfect. Ah, yeah. There you guys see. Uh, 조금 시간을 얼추 맞췄는데 조금 예, 성급합니다. 그죠? 예, 이런 부분들을 고쳐서 한번더 도전해 보도록 하겠습니다. 이제 조금 있다가 다시 한번 도전해 보도록 하겠습니다. 자, 버니클라 난국에 들어가기 전에 테드 읽기 마지막으로 한번 도전하고 끝내 보도록 하겠습니다. 시간은 3분 35초 준비 시작. Why the pencil is perfect. Why the pencil is perfect. The sound is a really big part, I think, of the experience of using a pencil, and it has the it has this really audible scratchiness. Scratching, small thing, small thing, big idea. Caroline Weaver and the pencil. The pencil is a very simple object. It's made of a wood with some layers of paint on eraser and the core, which is made out of graphite, clay, and water. Yeah, it took a hundred hundred of people over centuries to come to this design. And it's the long history of a collaboration that, to me, makes it a very perfect object. The story of the pencil starts with the graphite. People started finding really useful applications for this new sub substance. 
They cut it into small sticks and wrapped it in string or sheepskin or paper and sold it on the street of London to be used for writing or for drawing or a lot of times by farmers and shepherds who used it to make a mark their animals. Over in France, Nicolas Jacques Conte figured out a method of grinding the graphite, mixing it with powdered clay and water to make a paste. From there, this paste was filled into a mold and fired in a clean a kill and the result was a really strong graphite core that wasn't breakable it was smooth usable it was so much better than anything else that existed at the time and to this day that's the method that's still used in making pencils meanwhile over in america in concord massachusetts it was henley david thor who came up with the grinding grading scale for different hardness of pencil it was graded one through four Number two being the ideal hardness for general use. The softer the pencil, the more graphite it had in it, and the darker and the smoother, smoother the line will be. The firmer the pencil, the more clay it had in it, and the lighter and the finer it will be. Originally, when pencils were handmade, they were made around, there was no easy way to make them, and it was the Americans who really mechanized, mechanized the craft. A lot of people credit Joseph Dixon for being one of the first people to start developing actual machines to do things like cut wood slats, cut grooves into the wood, apply glue to them. And they figured out it was easier and less wasteful to do a hex hexagonal pencil and so that, the, so that became the standard. Since the early, uh, early days of a pencil, people have loved that they can be erased. Originally, it was bread, bread clumps that were used to scratch away pencil marks and later rubble and pumice. The attached the eraser happened in 1858 when Americans stationer Heimer Ripman patented the first pencil with an attached eraser which really changed the pencil game. The world's first yellow pencil was the Koenur 1500 Koenur did this crazy thing where they painted this pencil with 14 coats of yellow paint and dipped the end in 14 karat gold. There is a pencil for everyone and every pencil has a story. The Blackwing 602 is famous for being used by a lot of writers, especially John Steinbeck and the Vladimir Nab 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 Nabokov. And then you have the Dixon Pencil Company. They are responsible for the Dixon Ticonderoga. It's an icon. It's what people think of when they think of a pencil and what they think of when they think of a school. And the pencils are really a thing that I think the average user has never thought twice about how it's made or why it's made the way it is. Because it's just always been that way. In my opinion, there's nothing that can be done to make the pencil better than it is. It's perfect. Wow. 이거 지금 뭐든 하고, 음, 아우, 입도 아픈데다가 핑계를 자꾸 대야 되겠습니다. 시간을 못 맞추는 거에 대해서. 예, 네, 제가 많이 아픕니다. 음, 어쩔 수 없죠. 네. 자, 오늘 태도 연습은 여기까지 하고 낭독에 들어가 보도록 하겠습니다. 아니, 근데 입이 좀 많이 아프긴 하네. Chapter 3 Some Unusual Goings On The next few days passed uneventfully. I was very bored. Our new arrival slept all day, and Chester, whose curiosity had been aroused by the strange behavior of the rabbit that first night, had decided to stay awake every night to observe him. Therefore, he too spent most of his days sleeping, so I had no one to talk to. The evenings weren't much better. Toby and Pete, who used to play with me as soon as they got home from school, now ran immediately to that silly rabbit's cage to play with it. Or at least they tried to. But Nicola did not make the most energetic playmate. It took him quite a while to wake up each night. And then, when he did awaken, he didn't do much except hop around the living room. He didn't play catch, he didn't fetch, he didn't roll over to get his tummy rubbed. I couldn't understand why they played with him at all. I expect it was because he was new and different. But I was confident that 
They very soon tire of him and come back to trust the old Harold. Finally, on the morning of the first day, I caught Chester Blair's eye over the wash water dish. He grumbled at me in a most unpleasant manner. You know, Chester, you were never exactly charming in the morning, but lately you've become downright, downright grumpy. Chester growled in response. What are you doing this for anyway? What are you looking for? He's just a cute little bunny. Cute little bunny? Chatter was amazed at my character analysis. That's what you think. He's danger to this household and everyone in it. Oh, Chatter, I said with an indulgent smile. I think your reading has gone to your head. It's just because I do read that I know what I'm talking about. Well, what are you talking about? I still don't understand. I'm not sure yet, but I know there's something funny about that rabbit. That's why I have to keep a rod. But <laughs> look at you. You're exhausted. You sleep all the time. How can you call that a rod? I'm awake when it's important. He sleeps all day. So I sleep all day. So just what have you seen since the first night that makes you uneasy? Well, said Chester. I, uh, that is... At this point, Chester started to bathe his tail which is a catch way of changing a subject he finds uncomfortable. He then stumbled sleepily into the living room. So, I asked again, following him, What have you seen? Nothing, he snapped, and proceeded to curl up on his chair to go to sleep. After a moment, he opened one eye. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to see. For the next few mornings, it was the same routine. I'd be ready for a good romp around the living room, and the chatter would go to sleep. Pete and Toby were at school. Mr. Morner was at the university. He never did too much romping around anyway. And Mrs. Morner was at her office. No one to play with the poor, neglected Harold. At first, I thought that I could strike up a friendship with a bunicula and maybe teach him a few tricks. But I could never wake him up. He was always waking up just about the sunset when I wanted to take a snooze. A rabbit, I concluded, is a clue to look at. It's cute to look at, but it's generally useless, especially as a companion to dogs. So I would retire each day with my favorite shoe to the rag and chew. Now some people... Especially Mr. M says Mono can't understand my taste for shoes and yell at me for snacking on them. But I always say there's no accounting for taste. For instance, I remember one evening when Mr. Mono picked some of his sour balls out of the bowl by his, his chair and dropped a green one on the floor. He didn't notice as it rolled across the room and landed near my nose. I decided this was a perfect opportunity to try one for me myself. I placed it in my mouth and wished immediately that I hadn't. As the tears started running out of my eyes, I thought, what's wrong with my mouth? It's turning inside, inside and out. Mr. Murner immediately noticed that something had happened. What's the matter, Harold? Are you looking for someone to kiss? Help, help. I want you to cry. But all that came out was an oo-hoo sound. I oo-hooed for days. So how can anyone who likes green sour balls criticize me for preferring an, a, nice, a nice penny roper or a bedroom slipper? But back to the matter at hand. One morning, Chatter had the news. That bunny, he whispered to me across our food bars. Food bars. Got out of his cage last night. Don't be ridiculous, I said. How could he break through that wire? Look how little he is. That's just it. He didn't break through any wire. He got out of his cage without breaking anything or opening any doors. I looked puzzled, so Chester told me the following story. Now, Harold, he said, I don't want you thinking I'm not a good watch cat. But after a few hours late night last night, I grew curious about the time. I went into the hallway and, you know that new clock that they've got? The big one? 
They go all the way to the ceiling? Well, see, it has this thing in the middle called a pendulum. At first, I figured I would just leave it alone. It looked like this pool they tied on a string and hung from the doorknob for me to play with when I was a kitten. Every time I hit the silly spool with my paw, it would swing back and hit me on the nose. I hated that toy. So naturally, when I saw this one, I decided not to have anything to do with it. I checked the time. It was midnight. I was all set to go back to the living room when something stopped me. Curiosity, I ventured. I suppose you could call it that. I prefer to think of it as the challenge of the unknown. I put one paw over my nose and reached out with the other one and gave it one good smack. I darn near broke my arm. It's still tender. See how swollen it is. He, so, he showed me his little paw. I couldn't see anything wrong. But I knew better than to argue with him. Argue with him. Oh yes, I said. That looks terrible. You must be suffering awfully. You'd better go easy today. He limped dramatically, just far enough to display his new handicap, and continued. I couldn't even get to the pendulum. Somebody had to put glass in front of it, and I was pretty mad. I was all set to go back, but at the same time, I couldn't help watching the thing move back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It was so easy to watch, and before I knew that what had happened, I was waking up. You fell asleep? I asked incredulously. I couldn't help it. I didn't even know it had happened. But I looked up at the face of the clock and it was 12.45. I'd been gone 45 minutes. I ran back into the living room, looked at Bonicola's cage, and it was empty. I couldn't imagine where he was. Then I noticed a light coming from under the kitchen door. I went into a crouch, stalking the light, when click. I heard the refrigerator door close, and the light went out. It must have been Mr. Morneau having his midnight snack. I suggested. No, that's, that's what I thought. I jumped on my chair, called a rear kick, and kept one eye open, pretending to be asleep. Slowly, the door to the kitchen squeak, squeaked open. This little head poked out from around the corner and I looked to either side to see if the coast was clear. Then, guess who came bouncing out all by himself? And would that idiotic grin of his plastered all over his face? Well, I guess it was to Mr. Monroe, I said. Not unless he wears the bunny pajamas and gets very tiny at night. But Nicola, huh? You got it, unfortunately. I had to position myself so that I could see him get back into the cage, and I didn't want to let him know that I that I had seen anything. So I had to stay put. I still don't know how he got out. He got out or back in. At this point, Mr. Morneau came downstairs to make a breakfast. I wondered if Chester hadn't dreamed the whole thing. He did admit he had fallen asleep, and as I've said, he has quite an imagination. But I was game. 